welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to show you a simple way to paint a realistic black swan and I will give you a few important tips on how to paint black subjects including animals and birds. If you are just starting your watercolor journey and you're interested in painting black and dark subjects, you can get a few helpful strategies and start exploring some realistic shapes using a limited palette. And do it with confidence, knowing how to organize your paint layers step by step so you can get the results you want. One of the main things I want to focus on today is how to add a sense of realism to your black subject when you are tempted to use black watercolor but you also don't want it to appear boring and flat. As you can see here, we will go from a very light underpainting step, then create our dark layer of feathers and then follow with some very selective application of darker pigments to accentuate the shadows. A very helpful way to look at this as you're planning your layers is to imagine the entire composition in black and white. This will help you understand which areas will require more work and more layers of color. And I will take you through this whole process in just a minute. The second thing that will be useful for anyone who ever wanted to paint feathers, especially on a large bird like this, is how to simplify and abstract the feather shapes and use a variation in your brush stroke thickness direction and length to create a realistic effect. And lastly, at the end of this video, I will address what will likely be a sticky point for those of you who are more experienced or advanced watercolor artists, namely the use of black pigment straight from the tube. This can be a fairly controversial topic and uh, I've touched upon this in the past, so this is a good time to explore it a bit more in depth. And as always, I will try to give you a balanced perspective. Now you can download the reference photo of the swan from Unsplash website. I left a link in the video description below along with the full list of my materials. Let's take it to the table and you will see exactly how we get from step one and all the way to a beautiful black swan. Before we start painting, it's helpful to create an outline outline of the swan, the beak and the eye, and also some feathers. But instead of capturing every little detail, let's identify a few important clusters of feathers and capture just a few of those shapes. So no need to outline them all, but just the bigger ones, the bottom half of the neck for sure, the large feathers on the wing. Notice we sort of have two sections there, the darker ones that go to the side and lighter ones on top of the wing that point up. Maybe just a few feathers closer to the beak and that's because we want to have some strong detail closer to the beak and the eye to draw the viewer's attention there. The rest of the feather texture we will be able to achieve by using our brush a certain way and you will see how in just a moment. So in step one we will do a very light layer of color and this is what we call an underpainting meaning we will create a layer of colors that will shine through your next two layers and they will give us a bit of a better sense of realism for the beak it's very straightforward just a very thin layer of uh, my cool red as you can see i'm using one straight from the dot chart because i don't have a full tube of this particular Winsor Newton pigment and this is why I love dot charts. They give us an opportunity to test our colors before we're ready to commit to buying a full tube or a whole set. Let me explain why I start with the beak. It's a red color which if I happen to paint in the last step may overlap with black and touch some of the black pigment that we already put down and it will get muddy around the edges. Now, if I put down my red first and then go over with black on top, once the red is dry, there's no risk there. Our black pigment will not get dirty or muddy by touching the red. By the way, if you want to see this entire painting in real time, very slowly, stroke by stroke, it's about an hour and a half long and you can visit my Patreon, which I just created because so many of you are asking for uh, this type of tutorial in long form, in real time, and it's very simple. I just have a one tier there. You will be able to see this one and all my upcoming YouTube videos rolled out into a real time long form. And uh, you will also be able to download a black and white outline of the subject that I'm painting. So now this is done and I will use a mixture of violet and blue to leave a small mark on the tip of the beak and also the eye. 
Now let's move on to the rest of the body and I will just start here mid neck where I want to eventually see some blue undertones. And as I move down, I will be adding some violet. You can use purple or magenta mixed with blue here. Notice that I left a few white spots untouched and this is on purpose. So I don't want to spend an hour going over each highlight, each feather with masking fluid. This is a fairly small painting and we can achieve that effect of realistic feathers fairly simply by just leaving a few highlights here and there. It really cuts down the painting process in half, if not more, not using masking fluid. And of course, it depends on your preference and your goals for each painting. Sometimes I love nothing more than hyper-realistic feathers that take hours and hours to paint and it's sort of like a meditation with watercolor. But is this the only way to paint? Absolutely not. There are so many ways to uh, represent your subject on paper using color and oftentimes simplifying and abstracting certain details is actually preferred. Again, my goal here is to show the overall silhouette, so I will be comfortable just using few feather highlights and you will see how it plays out as we start adding black in the next layer. You can see I've followed up with another large area of violet and blue and now I'm doing a spot of violet at the bottom side of the wing. It's important here not to blend it too much with the rest of the swan because we want that wing shape to look somewhat separate looking closely at the reference photo. So more saturated violet there and then some blue on top of the wing. A little bit of blue on top of the head and then going down to the beak, I'll put down purple again. Ending with purple makes sense here as it is closer to red than blue, if you consider the color spectrum. So we have a nice underpainting transition from blue to violet and all the way to our cool red on the beak. Notice again that I'm leaving quite a few spots blank because the light is coming from the left and down so lots of highlights here in this area and we do have highlights in other places but as you've probably heard me say many times before if you've been watching any of my previous tutorials the more detail we add the more the eyes are drawn to that area making it appear closer and more interesting so adding strong contrast and lots of detail around the eye of the bird will reinforce for the viewer uh, who will see the painting that this this area is the center of the composition and we will reinforce it once again we will reinforce those highlights by making the shadows more intense under the eye so this will all work together to create lots of contrast and visual interest variation and values where we want them to be and now it's time to get our black pigment out the first layer is completely dry and as you can see after I squeezed a little bit from the tube I'm going to generously add some blue into it. The same blue we've used for our underpainting in step one. Even though we didn't mix our own black from scratch doesn't mean we can be adding other colors, other pigments into it to sort of adjust the temperature and add a sense of realism. So I will start from the darkest area around the eye and proceed from there. You will notice that my strokes will start very small and then get bigger and bigger and less detailed as we move from the eye and all the way down the neck and to the wings. In some cases, I will change the angle of my brush and you will see the result in just a minute. And that is the beauty of watercolor because we have so much water in our black blue mixture every stroke we put down will be semi-transparent and the colors and the strokes underneath will be visible creating a more realistic effect revealing the variation in light and shadow areas as we move up from the head of the bird and then down the neck towards bigger feathers Notice that I also drew a very thin, dark line along the front of the beak. And now I'm going to follow up along the neck, 
gently changing the angle of my brush as the angle of the neck curves to the right. My strokes will also be much more elongated and maybe a bit thicker as I move up the neck. You can follow all the way along the neck and down, but I'm going to pause actually on top here and switch to those bigger feathers in the middle of the neck. Those ones we've outlined with our pencil in the beginning. And the reason for doing this is once I have these two areas, short, simple feathers on uh, the head and then more interesting, larger feathers on the other side of the neck, I will have an easier time merging them together in a more cohesive way. You will see that in a minute. So here the stroke is different. I'm actually trying to follow the outline of the feathers that we drew with our pencil and I'm keeping my brush almost parallel to my paper, more accurately at about 45 degree angle so that I can get the tip of the brush to start the shape and then the belly of the brush just sort of drags along and gives me a thicker line, the shadow underneath each feather. So no straight lines here, just sort of mimicking the jagged edge of each feather. Now I'm going to do some feather shapes under the wing, right on top of that violet underpainting area. And I'm mixing a little bit of violet into my black here. My brush is also on an angle, but my strokes are much longer and they're also on an angle, sort of like half moons. And now let's finish off this section on the side. It has less of a shadow, it's more sort of capturing the sunlight. So I'm using a slightly more diluted mixture of black and blue. Again, my strokes are much bigger here because we are further away from the head of the bird. And here between the wing and the neck, we have a really strong shadow. So I'm actually going to pre-wet a fairly large area with clear water and then just drop some black directly into it. Let the darker pigment spread and create a nice shadow effect, a border between the wing and the neck. I'm going to come back and finish that area on top of the neck as I promised you in the beginning of this step, starting with short strokes and then slowly progressing by pressing my brush more and turning it sideways a little bit so that my strokes are getting longer and thicker. This area on the wing has the biggest feathers, so it's not that difficult to just paint what we see in this case and actually accurately follow the reference photo. We don't need to simplify the shapes at all, so I will follow my pencil outline and just paint the feathers as they actually appear in the reference. The last item on our to-do list for this second step is to add some definition on the beak and I will use the same permanent rose and maybe a little bit of Windsor blue to add some shadows on the front of the beak. Once step two is done, let it dry thoroughly and now we can finish this one by adding some definition and accentuating some shadows. So we will start with this and end up with something like this. To really create a sense of realistic volume, we will need to look at the reference photo closely and decide where our dark areas will need to, to look even darker. So as you will see slowly, step by step, I will be going over the following areas with a tip of my brush around the eye the top of the neck, between the wing and the neck, and definitely under the wing. I may also add a few very small dark accents on this area of the wing, and also, of course, the bird's eye and the beak, but those will be really tiny, just to bring out some distinct details. For the most part, I will be focusing on the areas I just showed you and now we don't need to worry about coming up with stroke shapes. Simply follow what's already there, the feather shapes that you have identified with your brush in step two 
and add more pigment where you think you need. While I'm doing this, let me come back to the topic of using black watercolors straight from the tube because I think it's very interesting and very important to address. It inevitably comes up in any foundational watercolor course and has been covered by pretty much every beginner and advanced watercolor instructor, including numerous videos here on YouTube. So here's my perspective. Using black straight from the tube is not forbidden, but it is a shortcut, meaning it's a simple way to get darker value and while certainly useful in some cases, can get you in a bit of trouble if you overuse it or start mixing too much black with other colors, just like any shortcut has a downside. As I've said it myself many times on this channel, I don't usually use black straight from the tube. Instead, I use a variety of pigments like indigo, perlin violet, burnt sienna, various mixtures, um, a bunch of other pigments to create my own black. I'll explain why without getting too scientific. So black is not a color that can be found in nature. It's rather an absence of color uh, because color comes to us as a result of light waves and different colors represent different wavelengths. So even when we see something as black, truly it actually has an underlying color, oftentimes with a variation in temperature, so from cool colors to warm colors. Another reason for not using black is every object that is visible to the eye contains reflections from other objects around us. So a black bird swimming in the lake will have some shiny reflections from the green blue water and uh, those of course come as a result of the sky reflection in the water and maybe some underwater elements and similarly a black camera in my room right now the one that i use to tape this will have a ton of warm undertones because the four walls are covered with uh, warm orangey kind of wood and the light just keeps reflecting off the walls and uh, onto everything on my table so it all sounds a bit complicated maybe because it is which is why sometimes we need a shortcut which brings us to my first reason for using black straight from the tube in my painting the reason why i think it's totally okay to use it sometimes is if your goal is not so much to create a realistic sense of light on your subject but something else like i have a very specific goal for this painting and that is to create a very strong striking silhouette that captures the beauty of this specific bird. I will not be adding any other background elements with color. I'm not concerned so much with natural light for the purposes of this work. The painting is more on the decorative side, you can say, and that's just the way I like it in this case. At the same time, I don't want it to look too flat, which is why I included an underpainting. By the way, most of the time when I want to paint a striking black subject, I just use India ink. And you can see several tutorials on my channel specifically about watercolor inks. I just want to be clear on the reason why you often hear this rule about not using black. So mixing your own black watercolor allows us to achieve slight variations in color temperature throughout your painting. So like adding warmer tones and colder tones like blues allows your black mixture to look more lifelike and that is very important in order to achieve realism. But color temperature is a massive topic that in my opinion should be covered once you're already comfortable with layering and other techniques. Uh, which brings me to the second reason why I used black straight from the tube here. So over the past year or so that I've been creating these videos on YouTube and reading your comments, um, I realized that majority of my followers are either very early beginner or intermediate watercolor artists and I create these tutorials focusing on one big topic at a time, in this case painting a dark almost black bird with a defined feather texture. Mixing blacks is a whole separate topic that requires a bit of theory and I'm happy to cover it separately but I do think that it would be an overload for this specific video. Certainly when I was starting out in watercolor medium I didn't feel like learning about the mixing too early on, the whole mixing theory, and I wanted to have a grasp of painting techniques that I felt were more helpful in terms of 
my progress and getting excited about certain subjects that I wanted to paint. And that essentially is my goal for this channel, is to help everyone who wants to get better, to progress, to see results, and to be enthusiastic about the medium without getting overwhelmed. So it is true that black straight from the tube is not ideal, and this has to do with unique properties of watercolor medium because the essence of watercolor is transparency and we can usually create a dark mixture of colors and different artists have their own different preferences but the goal is always the same to be able to add different proportions of cool and warm pigments to show a variation in temperature and reveal the underlying color and the reflecting colors so this is all about sort of creating a realistic result on paper but it's not a hard rule certainly not something that should be followed strictly so with this in mind i can't wait to hear your perspective i may be completely off base here of course and i'm happy to adjust the way i explain these things but uh, i hope you see that my goal is always to provide a balanced perspective and uh, helpful advice above all else I'm not a big fan of hard rules, also watercolor is uh, a lifelong learning journey and we evolve as we learn more, so all that is to say, mix your own black or use one straight from the tube. The most important thing is that you are creating art and mastering the medium and enjoying yourself in the process. The rest is sort of less important and those of you who prefer the so-called pure way of using black watercolor uh, will enjoy mixing and coming up with various shades of black using other pigments while for many others it will be less of a concern because their way of artistic expression is different and that's totally acceptable as long as you're creating and finding joy in what you do. I would say that at this point the bird looks almost ready but of course there is always an opportunity to take it a step further and that's exactly what I'm going to do with a few finishing touches. I feel like what's really important here is to make the head of the swan even darker. So I will do that with yet another layer of black. Notice my strokes. I'm definitely not going to simply cover the bird's head with a solid layer of black and blue, but rather use the tip of my brush to paint very short, quick strokes, many of them overlapping, to create that texture that we see in the reference photo. So mimicking the direction and length of the feathers on the head of the swan. Some of them closer to the top of the head are more straight and elongated. Some of them under the eye are more curved and maybe a little bit shorter. And I will also add another glaze of color, a little bit of blue and a little bit of violet. I think maybe in some areas our underpainting wasn't strong enough to bring out those uh, blue and violet tones. So I will literally just paint over some areas with blue and violet where I think I need a little bit of a boost. And the last thing I will do is definitely accentuate that dark area between the wing and the neck because it really stands out in the reference photo and it will really help us create a more realistic sense of 3D shape on two-dimensional plane. Huge thanks to Windsor Newton for providing these materials for me to test as part of the uh, Windsor Newton Made for Every Moment challenge which uh, you should definitely check out and participate in if you're on Instagram. So with that, I'm going to put away my brush and work on finishing another painting for now. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful week ahead. I will see you soon.